Okay. Well, I, I guess we'll get started. Uh, welcome everybody to Exploring Care Options and Trial Opportunities for Minimal Change Disease and FSGS Patient Session. Once we get started, feel free to ask any questions that you might have for Dr. Udani during the session. Um, we will at the end have a Q&A, but if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Well, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sunil Udani, an adult nephrologist and physician research director um, at Nephrology Associates of Northern Illinois and Indiana. Dr. Udani is a native of Chicago's Western suburbs. He completed his undergraduate master's in public health and medical school degrees at Northwestern University and University of Pittsburgh. He served as a chief medical resident at Cook County Hospital prior to returning to the University of Chicago for his fellowship in nephrology. Dr. Udani is the author of multiple peer reviewed journal articles and has presented his research at national conferences and is the author of multiple textbook chapters on diagnosis and management of kidney disease. His focus is on glomerular disease and heart kidney interactions. He is also a clinical investigator for the community-based renal research program and is a dedicated educator and advocate for patients with kidney disease. Dr. Donnie, welcome and it's a pleasure. Thank you, thank you for the kind introduction as well as the invitation to be here today. I know this is a, a different environment than we are used to in a difficult time for all of us, but I'm hoping that um, people are safe and that they find this uh, the day as well as this session to be um, helpful. Um, so along those lines, as, as you've already outlined, I really encourage um, people to ask questions. Uh, I have sort of a, um, a talk that I've uh, developed, but really this is meant to be tailored toward you. Um, and so uh, other, if there are things that I'm saying that are not clear or things that you'd like, like me to elaborate on or things we haven't connected on or uh, discussed, then that's what we really like to um, uh, make sure we have time for. So I'll start out <clears throat> with some overviews um, and talk a little bit about therapeutics. And then we'll, as I said, move on to what questions people have. So these are uh, my disclosures. So I think there's probably a, um, a fairly wide degree of, uh, of experience with these diseases in the audience um, in terms of how long people have had them or what they've experienced with it. So I'd like to kind of walk through things from the basics in terms of you know, defining the disease and I'll give you some uh, perspective from a, uh, from a nephrologist. So the first thing, um, you know, these uh, diseases in particular, minimal change, these FSGS is sort of odd names you'd, you'd think. And the nomenclature has um, been part of the reason I think we haven't made as much progress or the, at least the classification system. It also is something that is very difficult for trainees to understand. I, I'll say even until I was a nephrology fellow focusing on glomerular disease, it was hard to understand where these, um, where these uh, names came from and what their implications were. So the two diseases we're talking about are um, you know, we refer to it as minimal change disease and focal and segmental glomerular sclerosis. And what you have here in terms of the images, the top slide is a, uh, is a biopsy specimen of a patient with a minimal change disease and the bottom of a patient with focal segmental sclerosis. And it's important to really pick apart the name to understand what we are referring to. So minimal change disease is really referred to minimal change because unlike microscopy, which means after the kidney biopsy is taken, and the sample is looked at under a regular microscope, the kidney looks pretty normal. It's minimally changed from a normal kidney. Um, and uh, you really cannot necessarily identify that there is a, a disease state. It's only when you get to the uh, very high magnification level, what we call electron microscopy, that you can see uh, changes in the kidney, uh, in the glomerulus, um, at the level of the, the cell called the podocyte, which is really the anchor of the kidney filter and how um, uh, protein loss is prevented. Um, but the, the concept of minimal change is just that, just that the unlike microscopy, um, there is, there's minimal change from normal. Focal cemental glomerular sclerosis, again, is really descriptive. Um, what it's saying is that a foci, uh, meaning a third or less of the glomeruli, the kidney filters, seen on a biopsy specimen, 
have a segmental, a, an area of scar. Um, and uh, if you have, you know, that is um, compared to if you have diffuse or global glomerulosclerosis, which means that you know, more of the glomeruli have all scar. So, you know, this sort of classification system, as you can sort of appreciate, it doesn't really say anything about how that got there and why the disease originated, um, uh, what, uh, what was the cause of it. It really doesn't appreciate the large heterogeneity, large variation in these diseases, meaning that people with FSGS, where they have a full on nephrotic syndrome with heavy protein loss, low protein in the blood, fluid retention, versus people who just have protein loss, are they really different? Uh, which they certainly are. Um, how things develop, was this something that oftentimes we will see really in a two week period, people develop you know, 40 pounds of fluid retention, or is this something that was more indolent and developed over perhaps months, years, or, or longer? Um, what about the associated kidney function and how those changes again, speak to differences in the underlying condition? And you know, what this has done is clustered conditions that are probably really distinct, even within minimal change, there's probably multiple variations of that. Within FSGS, there is a multitude of variations that get clustered as FSGS. And so we have clustered things that really shouldn't be clustered and sometimes separated things that shouldn't be separated. Minimal change in FSGS to some degree can be looked at as the same underlying biology. So, you know, there are real implications for this. You know, one is that it's difficult for people to understand what their condition really is and what the cause is, but also uh, has strong implications in terms of how much progress we've made. You know, in 2021, if you can believe this, even though we've known about these conditions, as Dr. Rowe said earlier, you know, for 50 years, we have zero FDA approved therapies, um, which is, you know, as, as maddening as a clinician, I'm sure as a patient or a patient family member, even more maddening. And our, unfortunately to date, our, it's not as if people haven't tried, um, but our literature has been, you know, time after time of, a, of what we call a negative trial, meaning that the intervention did not show that it was better than standard of care. And a big part of that was that, again, you cluster certain conditions together. And if you try to treat 18 different things with the same uh, therapeutic intervention, and you don't see that it helps all 18 different things, of course not. Um, and other specialties have gotten much better at this. Um, oncology is the, the one that um, we really look to to say, okay, they have been much better at defining, not all lung cancer is the same, not all breast cancer is the same, um, not all leukemia is the same. And so they have honed in on very specific uh, aspects of each individual and then have developed therapies to do that. Now we're getting closer to that. And I think that as, as um, uh, Josh Tarnoff mentioned in the beginning that we may have you know, the first ever FDA approved therapy for FSGS and that's been long time coming. A lot of effort from you know, scientists much smarter than me, investigators like myself and Dr. Rowan, Dr. Cobb who've try to execute these trials, try to pick the right patients for these trials. Um, uh, but I think that our, it's really the, 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 the um, our uh, failures in my mind sort of start the, the way we've defined these. And again, hopefully that will change, but have not yet. So if, if um, that being said, so what's actually happening? And I, I like to go through this with patients I see, and I know that some of this is gonna be more information than you're familiar with or necessarily you may want to know, but I think it's important for you just for people to understand kind of how we think about things. So ultimately what we're referring to, what we're um, focusing on is what ha is happening at the level of the kidney filter. Um, so if you have, you know, most of have two kidneys and within each kidney, there are um, uh, the glomeruli, which is the filtering structure. And we are all born with about a million glomeruli, somewhere between half a million and a million in each kidney. And the kidney filter, the glomerulus, really allows for the blood filtration process to begin. And like any filtration process, there's a, you know, there's a, uh, things, some things should get filtered through and some things shouldn't get filtered through. 
and th small things like salt and water and other waste should easily get filtered. But the makeup of the filter is, is you know, is in such a way that um, it should not let larger things through. Things like blood, protein um, should not go through. And so we know when that we see those things that there is a issue at the level of this kidney filter. So um, what is that structure that prevents that? And that's where we look at this, what's referred to as the podocyte, and you'll see these little blue, you know, blue ones on these images. And the way I look at the podocyte, again, is sort of the anchor or the, 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 the foundation for this filter. And the, the metaphor that I've used for people, and I hope this, this um, helps, is so you have an open, an open circle, an open drain. And you, on each end of that drain, start to interconnect thousands and thousands of, of bungee cords, little hooks on each end. And by doing that, you make essentially a net or essentially ultimately a filter. And those, when it's, in, when it's intact, that is in such a way that there are only very small holes that go through. And what I would consider is those hooks as the podocyte we call foot processes. And if you start to unhook those, if something injures that, so that they can no longer hold on to the edges. You start to unwind all those bungee cords and you can imagine what happens. The holes start to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So ultimately where you're leaking everything through. And so our targets of therapy ultimately are to restore the integrity of that, allow those hooks to get back on and also stop the process of whatever was causing the injury. In terms of focal sclerosis or FSGS in particular, as I said, the reason that it's, you know, it doesn't, it's not really a disease state, it's more descriptive is that any process that causes the injury to the, you know, the, the structure, repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly um, injury, um, there's a, a response locally of the kidney. I mean, just like anything else, if you keep injuring, if you have the same part of skin where it gets cut, gets cut, gets cut uh, uh, many, many times, you form scar tissue. And that scar tissue is what we see in the kidney as that sclerotic lesion. Um, so that the, what we're seeing is really the, the effect of whatever injury process occurred. Um, and that's of course disturbing to people like, well, I already have scar tissue there. Um, that's, that's not a good thing. Um, and absolutely it's not. Um, and so I think identifying, you know, the protein loss earlier on. Now the kidney can heal, so a lot of these things can 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 um, uh, can get better if the sort of onslaught of injury, whatever is causing the injury, can be stopped. And that's where kind of our therapeutic interventions are really trying to to focus on. So again, we know a lot more now than we did a few years ago. So this is a you know structure of this podocyte and these foot processes that I've talked about. And you can see these, all these little components in, in, the, in the bottom right, you see all these different proteins that we've identified that are key to maintain this integrity, maintain those hooks on that um, open drain. And identifying these is key for multiple reasons. One is of course that we can potentially find targets for therapy um, because if we think that one of these is being attacked or one of these are loss of uh, uh, integrity of one of these proteins is why we're losing, um, losing protein, then something to re help restore that can be helpful. It also has given us a better understanding of inherited causes of protein loss um, because we know that you know, genetic variations in each of these, as well as many others, can lead to um, the clinical manifestations of, of nephrotic syndrome. Now there's even more to it than this, but I think that um, again, this list is helpful to understand, okay, we now know how we are now understanding how complex this relationship is and also why then you see so many variations of this because any of these can be affected. So where, where, where were we and where are we now? And so this, I, this is uh, two slides I'll show is, this is where we were in 2015 in terms of the number of trials available for these uh, rare diseases. So you can see not very many. Now this is 2020. 
um, and you can see the amount of progress that's being made. And yes, not all of these will necessarily be viable options, but you can see that there's a, definitely a commitment from industry, from investigators, scientists, physicians, et cetera, to really identify new and better therapies because none of us should be satisfied with the status quo. Now, in terms of, you know, how do we uh, treat, if I have a patient with one of these conditions, nephronic syndrome, the sort of you know, general principles. Um, uh, I put two categories there, managing the complications of the nephrotic syndrome or protein loss, um, and then reducing protein in the urine. Um, so usually the immediate thing is, of course, management of complications they initially present, oftentimes if there's fluid retention, blood pressure can be high, um, they're losing lots of protein, so they are, they're at risk for, um, they're at higher risk for infection because they're losing antibodies as well. So we try to, again, do what we can to help uh, alleviate those complications. Oftentimes, you know, diuretics, uh, salt restriction, trying to reduce other burdens that can be, that can add to the kidney in terms of uh, high animal protein intake or processed food. Um, again, not only are we worried about the kidney, but of course, the effects on other organ systems. So we know that one of the biggest things we get concerned about is that associated with protein loss through a, a pathway that <clears throat> we can go into more detail um, is oftentimes high cholesterol. And so it's not necessarily the kidney problem itself that ultimately causes complications for people longer term, but it's high cholesterol, the effect on blood vessels, the effect of high blood pressure on blood vessels. And so they are at, at higher risk for cardiovascular illness. And so lowering that cholesterol, lowering their blood pressure becomes a mainstay initially of initial therapy. Now, ultimately our, our goal is to reduce protein urine because most, if not all of these complications are as a result of the protein loss. So why do we look at protein in the urine? Why do we, why do we target reduction of protein loss? For two reasons. It's, you know, it's an indication of how much stress is on a damaged lamellae, you know, like a damaged kidney filter. I mean, the more protein loss, it means that there's more pressure at that, that kidney filter. I sort of uh, use the simile or the analogy that it's you're overworking, um, uh, overworking the kidney. But also the more protein loss tells us how leaky that kidney filter is. And so as protein loss reduces, we know that we have been able to lessen the, the leakiness of the protein. Now there are sort of more general principles of reducing protein loss. Um, there's medications called ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers. Uh, we call them uh, inhibitors of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. These are conventionally blood pressure medications, but they lower specifically the pressure at the kidney. The new class of medications called sodium glucose transport inhibitors can also uh, help achieve this. But ultimately these are, again, more general ways to treat protein loss. And what we really like to find is disease specific therapy. So what is the best therapy for a person with minimal change? What is the best therapy for a person with FSGS? But sometimes again, as I said, specifically with FSGS, if it's not caused by the immune system being activated, then uh, medications like ACE inhibitors, ARBs, sodium glucose transport inhibitors, they can still be the mainstay of treatment um, and not steroids and things like that. So it really depends on each individual. Now, in terms of selecting the treatment for you, again, first and foremost, as already been outlined, you got to find the right partner um, because it's a difficult journey. And anybody that's experienced a rare disease knows how anxiety provoking it is, how difficult it is. Um, and you know, having someone that you feel confident and that you trust is of course key. And as already been outlined, I mean, this is not, these are not common condition. This is not diabetes, not high blood pressure. And so you have to have someone that has been seen this so that they appreciate the variations. They know what there are therapy options are there. Oftentimes they may have access to clinical trials. So that is important, but that's not enough, right? You can't, I mean, you know, just because I may have seen, you know, hundreds and thousands of patients with this, that's not enough to necessarily be the, the right care partner for, um, uh, that person, because they have to, in my opinion, they have to have empathy. 
You really have to think about a collaborative approach. What's going to work for that person? Humility, I think, is an, an incredibly important thing. I tell my patients, you know, I also I always encourage them, you know, if they feel interested in getting another opinion, they definitely should. But I say one thing: if you walk into a room and any nephrologist tells you that they know everything about these, uh, everything there is to know about these diseases, run the other way, because we know, as I've already outlined, very little, and we have, um, you know, we uh, know that there is a lot, a lot more we don't know than we know. And so we have to understand that and, and also um, help, uh, you know, kind of convey that. Um, um, availability is another thing. Um, you know, what I, what I mean by that is, you know, Dr., uh, Josh Tarnoff already outlined, um, you know, being able to access a specialist within a given period of time. If you call for an appointment, they say, yeah, we'll see you in three months. I mean, come on. Like, you know, this is not something that you know, I can wait. You need to have someone that's, you know, a, a clinician that will be available. And sometimes that means, you know, getting overbooked, coming at the end of the day, beginning of the day, what, whatnot, but you have to have that. And the, you know, the, the kidney health gateway, the specialist definitely has been um, a, a great resource, I think. And the list is building uh, every day and people have outlined saying, you know, if I love my nephrologist, can I nominate them? You can, you can definitely ask them to be, you know, to self uh, nominate. Um, and, you know, there's a important vetting process, but it's not based on titles or accolades or publications or anything like that. It's really about, you know, them being a good uh, person for patients with glomerular disease. Now, again, each treatment has its ups and downs. Um, nothing, uh, no matter what therapeutic intervention we choose, we cannot say that any of them are you know, completely uh, benign. And so when you pick one, you have to think, okay, what is the likelihood of the effect? What, how, what's the intensity effect, meaning how much of a response can I uh, expect? Um, and then duration, um, because again, that changes depending on the condition, depending on the medication. So again, finding that out uh, for each person is different. And it really is not a one size fits all approach. Now, that being said, there are some standard approaches that we are, that we generally adhere to. And this is, this is from the, the draft of the KDGO guidelines of 2020. So KDGO is the Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes. Essentially, it's a consortium of, again, the experts in the field um, that come together uh, within each area of nephrology, glomerular disease, high blood pressure, et cetera. And last year, they met and developed these guidelines. They then present them to, for you know, public opinion or you know, public commentary, meaning nephrologists, patients, you know, NEFCURE, saying, you know, these are the guidelines we propose, are there, are there things that you can identify that we've uh, uh, left out? And that process, once that's complete, then this will be finalized um, and, and released as, as guidelines. But they do have a draft, and this is still, again, the, the approach that we take. Um, in terms of minimal change, you know, fundamentally, it's still approached as a steroid response to disease. And still, the vast majority, even of adults, but not all, will respond to steroids. Um, uh, so unless it's a contraindication, the initial therapy is based on using steroids. However, the difficult part is that relapses are common. Um, you know, over half of the patients, adults, um, will relapse. And so this is not a, oftentimes a one and done. And so you have to have a plan in place or consideration in place of what comes next. The, as you can see on the, on the right, if individuals have frequent relapses, there are other options. Um, and and there are listed here, um, an old drug called cyclophosphamide is still oftentimes uh, advocated as the first line because of the, usually you can have a sustained um, remission afterward. But again, that again has to be individualized because cyclophosphamide does have quite a bit of toxicity. N newer agents, meaning newer than cyclophosphamide, but still decades old, particularly rituximab or the, we call the monoclonal antibodies, have become more and more an option in this particular category. Um, this individuals have relapsed, but steroid responsive minimal change disease. So if they're, you know, if they're, if you relapse or you're steroid dependent, um, you know, one option is using called calcineurin inhibitors. 
So drugs that have been developed for many years in use in kidney transplant patients and are used um, uh, as uh, another common therapy um, in proteinuric kidney disease. Um, the two most commonly used are tacrolimus and cyclosporin. They, are, they can be very effective. They can be effective for steroid, even individuals that do not respond to steroids. However, the problem oftentimes is that it's difficult to come off of them because the way they work is probably more about uh, kind of reinforcing that anchor, that hook to the uh, kidney filter. And so um, taking, once you take it off, um, that process of whatever started the injury can recur and protein loss begins again. Rituximab has become more and more a favorable option. Rituximab, for those of you not familiar, is a, we call a monoclonal antibody against um, B cells, which is one of the uh, types of white blood cells, immune cells. So monoclonal antibodies, what they would do is basically they tag a specific target. So rituximab targets something called CD20. CD20 is a little sort of badge or marker on um, these B cells that tell the body that that's what it is. And rituximab binds to that or tags it. And when it does that, the immune system clears it out. The rationale behind that is that we think that some of the nephrotic syndrome, some mineral change, some FSGS, um, their disease process is either originated or highly tied to the, 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 this type of cell, the B cells. And um, so depleting them, knocking them out, stopping the antibody production, then can then allow for the kidney to stop being sort of on, you know, uh, continuously affronted by the immune system and lead to a sustained um, and you know, very near complete or complete remission of disease. Now there's debate on you know, when to do it, um, how many times do it, meaning that do you give one dose or one single course, oftentimes it's given either weekly for four doses or every two weeks for two doses, or do you give it sort of a, in a structured continuous way, meaning the, the effect of the medication is usually about six months, six to nine months is when uh, the B cells start to sort of resurface. So some people have advocated um, that you continue therapy every six months for a fixed period of time, whether that's 18 months, 24 months, longer. And again, that has to be individualized to the, the person, depending on what their history is, it has to be balanced out with the risks of doing that. Um, and so it's not um, a universal approach. Individuals that are steroid resistant, minimal change, again, it does happen. It's not as often as an FSGS, um, but the options are not as good but they are, um, there are some. The calcium inhibitors, as we've talked about, uh, ACTH, which is a, um, a hormone that our body makes that's sort of a precursor to steroids, but also may have a separate effect on the kidney, has been increasingly used um, as a therapeutic option. There's something called the liposorber, which is a, a filter, not a dialysis filter, but a different filter that um, removes uh, cholesterol and things that are bound to cholesterol, which seems to be part of the process that can cause protein losing kidney disease. And that's also been used um, in, in actually in Japan for many years. More recently, it's been expanding to, from initially pediatrics to post-transplant people that have recurrent disease to individuals with a resistant disease. Now I will um, move on to FSGS. And as I've said, really, FSGS is not one disease, and it's really uh, uh, an overlap of many different conditions where the final pathway, the final result is this scar that's developed after that protocyte, that cell I've mentioned, um, is repeatedly injured. And this is one way to classify. Again, this is, I know, a little bit, um, you know, a lot of things that are complicated on this, this image, but so I'm just kind of walk through them. Let's walk through the, 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 the bubble on the left. We call the permeability factor mediated podocytopathy, you know, long-term. Podocytopathy, we'll start with that. So the podocyte, as I said, it's the cell that really is the anchor for the filter. So when we say podocytopathy, that's really meaning 
injury to that cell. This permeability factor is this idea that there's something in the immune system that's causing this. And we say it's permeability factor, meaning that it, it um, causes the kidney filter to become more leaky. Um, this is probably what we see in individuals that have steroid responsive and will change, that have steroid responsive FSGS or dependent FSGS, um, or particularly those that have recurrent FSGS after transplant. And this is the group that probably has the best um, likelihood of uh, leading to um, um, you know, of steroid responsiveness, but also can be steroid dependent. The other group is um, the, are, are ones that you know, oftentimes are not gonna have a response to immunosuppression. One is referred to as the toxic uh, the top. It's the same concept of injury to the, the cell, um, but it's due to a toxin. And that toxin can be an infection, uh, there's certain viral infections, actually I didn't include on here, but um, uh, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 can be associated with this. Some medications have been associated with this. The last two categories we know are not gonna be related to uh, response to immunosuppression. One is those are genetic causes. So these people that have an inherited condition that affects one of those various proteins I outlined or an inherited condition that affects the not just the, the, the cell that makes up the filter, but the more the network or that net of, that makes the filter called the glomerular base of membrane. And again, with genetic testing, um, this is becoming more and more of an option. The last category is what I call hyperfiltration or adaptive. So as I was, told, as I was saying that, you know, anything that causes scarring to the kidney can lead to FSGS. And the way to think about this is the idea between the imbalance between um, the load on the kidney filter and the capacity of the kidney filter. And so if you have an imbalance of any of those, either you have an increased load, oftentimes it's because of um, uh, heavy, uh, more weight carried around the midsection or on the belly, um, or if you have less kidney mass to begin with, you had only one kidney that you were born with uh, or one kidney that was removed, or individuals with a low birth weight, because we know that the number of filters that you actually have is largely tied to, to birth weight. So oftentimes I'll ask people, you know, what do you remember what you were, you know, what you weigh when you were born? And obviously, think it's, people think it's a strange question at first, but you can understand that it's, it's trying to us an understanding of what their filter capacity is. So you can see that this, this is a lot of variation in um, FSGS. And so we, it's definitely not a one size fits all approach, but it makes it quite complicated in terms of how to approach treatment. So trying to determine the nature of the FSGS is really the key. And so and not all FSGS is the same. When people come with the diagnosis of FSGS, trying to figure out, okay, what really is the cause here? Do I think it's an immune mediated process? Do I think this is genetic? Do I think this is they were exposed to some toxin? Genetic testing is much more available now. Um, uh, you know, insurance author is authorized, very easy with saliva or blood. And so now it really is becoming more and more a mainstay of the evaluation. Now this um, uh, flow chart on the right is the KDGO 2020 guidelines, there's how to approach it. And it really is trying to again, to find out um, who has, who may fit in that category of immune mediated um, where steroids will be helpful. Um, so if you have lo lots of protein, there's certain characteristics on the kidney biopsy we look at, if they have low protein in the blood, we think that there's enough here to at least warrant a trial of steroids. And it's, it's you know, I can understand the frustration from a patient perspective, say, why do I still need to be on steroids? And unfortunately, because we can't, we haven't been able to identify what this actual factor is, the response to steroid kind of tells us a little bit more about what is likely um, the underlying you know, uh, nature of the FSGS, meaning if they respond to steroids, then we're much more confident this is a immune process. And that subsequent treatments, even though you don't have to get steroids each time, subsequent treatments are um, kind of directed at the immune system. If you are not steroid responsive, then keep continuing to give you more and more immunosuppressive therapies. They're gonna knock out your immune system is oftentimes not helpful. And so, and as it carries a real risk. So we have to try to identify who's really gonna respond so that we can determine what to give them next. 
but also um, those people are not going to respond to not keep exposing them to toxic therapies um, because it doesn't do anyone any good. Um, so really trying to find out and classify, and we need to be better at this. You know, I'll be the first one to admit this. So genetic testing, looking at the biopsy, all these things have to be considered um, when you're thinking about um, the therapeutic approach. So again, this is another way to look at the approach. If you have nephrotic syndrome, which means heavy protein loss and low protein in the blood and fluid retention, you consider first line therapy, but you can see on the red, there's a very strong emphasis on genetic testing now because it is again, trying to better identify the condition and really prevent you from being exposed to things that are not gonna be helpful. And lastly, hopefully as we get to a more precision-based approach to therapeutics, we can better say, okay, this person has protein loss because they have a genetic variation in, in TRPC6 or type four collagen. So this is the way we should approach them as opposed to the sort of one size fits all approach that we've used for so long. Um, um, <clears throat> now in terms of the, the, the therapy, again, the first line therapy still is high dose steroids, which again is, is frustrating as a nephrologist, believe me. Um, but again, it is um, still where we, where we approach things if there's not a contraindication. And it's, it's a good, it's a high dose. And, it, and which, as I've said before, I hate giving this prescription. Um, uh, but if they respond and you can taper them off and they can be done with this, then, it's, then that makes it worthwhile. If there's contraindication steroids or there is um, other resistant steroids, then other therapies um, become uh, uh, the next step. Now I put a question mark next to rituximab as well as ACTH because rituximab in particular, if people are not steroid responsive, then it's a good, it's a good likelihood they don't have an immune mediated process. And so oftentimes they will not respond to steroids. I'm sorry, rituximab. And so giving that again, is, has important implications. The most you know, a timely implication right now is they, when you give rituximab, as I said, you knock out B cells, which are producing new antibodies. And so this has very strong implications in a pandemic. If you give rituximab, you will almost definitely not respond to um, vaccination against you know, COVID or anything else really for four to six months. Now you may have your other parts of your immune system may be able to respond, but it, it has changed, you know, the pandemic has forced us to uh, really think about this because if I'm committing someone to more rituximab, I have to really try to think about, okay, well, are they vaccinated? Can we get them vaccinated first, then give rituximab a few weeks later so they can already develop an immune response. If we don't, then, you know, what is their implication for with how they live their life? So these are real, you know, these are, these, each decision of this is not without consequence. So the questions that oftentimes come up are, you know, okay, I've responded to treatment. How long are you going to continue treatment? It really depends on which therapy you're on. And again, each individual, sort of the risk benefit. For steroids, again, that taper should be, if you respond, once you have a, a, a response, the taper should be over a few months, and much, you know, definitely less than a year probably less than six months. And really the last part of the taper is the lowest doses. For calcineur inhibitors, tacrolimus and cyclosporin, it's a very a much slower taper because we want people to have sustained response and then very slow over the course of a year, start to slowly dial down the dose and to see if there's evidence of relapse because you won't, don't want that to happen. And with rituximab in particular, again, a lot of complicating factors. Some people have advocated a sort of initial therapy and then a reactive approach, meaning that if you have a relapse after six months, nine months, 12 months, then give another dose. Some people have advocated, as I said, sort of this continuous, we call it referred to as continuous B cell depletion. So keep giving doses for every six months for the course of you know, two years. And the rationale behind that, and as a, as a, as a, it is a, an approach that I will use oftentimes, um, and the pandemic has made it more complicated, but because really we know that the immune response, this sort of the idea that the immune system knows how to attack the kidney is very deep seated. You know, it's, it's something that's very, you know, it's, it, you know, if you 
clear the immune response once, that may not be enough because there's still some cells that are lingering around in the bone marrow or in the lymph nodes or somewhere that still know how to cause this process. Um, on the other hand, um, for some people, it's sort of one and done. Um, but if it is more deep seated, then you kind of have to keep knocking down that I want what I, I, I uh, describe this as a full reboot of the immune system. Um, now that is not without risk. And that's where it becomes very important to individualize treatment. Just think about, you know, how bad was the relapse? What is the, what is the potential risk you can take of not doing therapy? Um, and again, what's the environment? You know, in, in the setting of a pandemic, I've been more reluctant if people have had a complete response and they're, they've been doing well, I've been more reluctant to say, okay, yes, for sure, you need to keep getting doses because um, the implications in terms of their risk for uh, infection. Now we talked a little about uh, a clinical trial enrollment um, and I think it's an important discussion to have. I think it's an important thing to consider. I think it's also not for anyone, uh, everyone, I should say. Um, I think, as I said before, as a clinician, you know, my, my, most of my job is to take, take care of patients. Um, and so if I'm going to think, consider a clinical trial, I have to really in my heart believe, and the evidence has to suggest this, that if they're in a trial, it's a randomized trial. So meaning that there's two arms that, that both arms are uh, equivalent from the standpoint of what we know based on the science at that time. Now, the talk about a placebo is something that, that's, um, that you know, comes up a lot. And yes, there's oftentimes a placebo, um, what I also refer to as an active comparator, because at the minimum, people should be in whatever arm of the trial they're in, should be receiving this, the standard of care. So you can't just have a placebo, just a placebo. They have to, if, there's a, if there's a standard of care that's established, no matter what for disease, they must be on that. And um, no trial would be designed or approved or, or taken up if not that. But the idea of a placebo we should understand is not purely that you're getting sort of nothing, um, but you should be at least getting the standard of care. That being said though, as I sort of outlined before, I tell people this, um, you know, it's really about paying it forward. You know, as a clinical trial, you will get extra attention. And you know, we watch people in a clinical trial like a hawk we want to know everything. We want to know if you got a hangnail. We want to know if you, you know, cut yourself shaving. We want to know everything about in terms of what is going on. But in the end, we don't know what arm you're on of, of the trial. We also don't know if the therapy is really effective as that was the case, we'd already be using it. And so this trial may not actually, quote unquote, treat your disease better. Now, undoubtedly though, it will help us understand what therapies work. And so I tell people, this is a selfless act. Um, yes, there may, we are gonna help you no matter what and do whatever we can, but a large degree of this is you are giving to us and the rest of the community. And we are un, you know, uh, extremely grateful for people that step up to do clinical trials because without them, we would never get anywhere. Um, and so if you, if you consider a trial, even if, you're not, if, you know, if you decide that it's not for you, even if, you, if it turns out you don't fit the criteria, just the fact that you express interest knows, and that's to us is we are grateful for because that's the only way we're gonna move forward. And that's the only way we've, you know, on the cusp of moving forward now. As I said, equipoise, is this really the best thing for me? And, you know, it has to be for, for each individual. Um, there also is the concept of rescue therapy. Now there, you know, if we really, People are truly getting worse while in a study. It's not that we do nothing. Uh, we have to think, okay, what is, the, what is our safety valve here? Again, if we really thought there was a better treatment, we should have already been getting it. Uh, they shouldn't be necessarily you know, randomized to a trial. Um, but that being said, if things are really getting worse and there's maybe an option that maybe will work for someone, we can say, okay, um, let's, we can you know, try salvage therapy, understanding that that's going to affect the, the, the results of the trial in terms of the data, but ultimately what's most important is the individual person's safety, their outcome. Um, and so, you know, and that's a discussion that certainly to have with, between you and you know, the, the, the investigator.
now there's some real clinical trial successes. Um, uh, duplex, which is the, the trial of sparsentan and FSGS, the, the preliminary data is positive. We'll hope for the final data to be positive so that FDA approval can occur. You may have heard that um, the class of medications, sodium glucose transport inhibitors, um, uh, have shown to be, you know, actually it was FDA labeled to be utilized in people with kidney disease at high risk for progression. So I would consider that deal with protein loss in the urine. And that's based on a study called DAPA-CKD. And within that study, they, are, they did include people with rare uh, protein losing kidney diseases, IgA nephropathy, FSGS. And they saw that in those uh, individuals, it can still be quite helpful. And so really that's the first drug that's been approved specifically for kidney disease in a very long time. There's a lot of other active clinical trials. You heard about the POTO trial earlier, you heard about the Traction 2 trial, which is through Goldfinch Bio. There's uh, the liposorber that I mentioned already is being actively studied. And then you heard about um, the trials specifically for those that have the APOL1 high-risk gene variant. Um, and that's the, the Vertex and, uh, and um, with Pfizer. So what about transplant? You know, ultimately, it's some, unfortunately, there are people that, that, that progress and they require transplant or dialysis. They have transplant. The problem with FSGS, even mineral change, is that there can be recurrence. And the cruel irony is that if you were steroid responsive, you were you're more likely then to relapse because then there's something in the immune system that still may be there. On the other hand, if you were steroid resistant, um, those are the individuals that are less likely to recur because it's likely that they are not, um, uh, there's not as much of an immune process there. If you have a genetic cause, um, certainly are not um, uh, had high enough, you know, higher risk relapse because you've replaced the genetic uh, problem. Um, unfortunately, it's, you know, uh, demographics, you know, they are vary depending on the individual uh, in terms of the risk of relapse. Uh, there are people that are higher risk, the lower risk. Um, White males with the FSGS um, uh, are the highest risk because oftentimes they're the ones that have this immune system mediated disease. If you've had a recurrence in a previous transplant, you're at high risk to have another recurrence. Dr. Donnie? Yes. Um, Somebody is asking um, with each relapse of uh, minimal change, does that play a factor in progressing to FSGS? It's a very good question. And the, the answer is yes. Um, so that you'll see this. You know, I take care of adult patients, but we oftentimes get individuals that had condition as, uh, as, as, as children or adolescents, and they have you know, relapse, then they have remission, and then they progress to adulthood, and they have protein loss, and you re-biopsy them, and they have FSGS. And that really sort of speaks to the, the point that these are not necessarily different diseases. It's not that the, FS, the mineral change changed in FSGS. It's just that the repeated injuries have not caused that scar tissue to develop. So in most cases, we won't re-biopsy anymore because we know what the condition is. Whether it's FSGS, whether it can be called FSGS or not, now is not the issue. It's you had a steroid responsive, an immune mediated, circulating factor related, you know, podocyte injury. And so the approach to treatment really should be along those lines. So there are some strategies to reduce uh, recurrence as uh, I mentioned, plasma exchange, again, liposorber, these are ways to try to remove whatever it is that's causing this. Those, are, of course, are limited in how long you can do them. You don't, you know, you don't want to want to trade dialysis for another therapy that you have to go for twice a week and get filtered through the blood. Um, the immunosuppression post-transplant um, does, we know, help with, you know, as the, a lot of the drugs are overlapping, steroids, calcium inhibitors are used in transplant as well as in um, FSGS, and so they can be helpful. There's some other things like rituximab, as I already mentioned, has been utilized with some success, um, ACTH as well. Um, but again, it's got to be an individualized approach. So I'll finish off with a few, you know, uh, last points. Here's my wish list um, as a nephrologist. So first thing, I'd like to have an easily accessible, non-invasive lab test that tells us the etiology of disease. So member, many of you may be familiar with membranous nephropathy. It's one of the other rare protein losing kidney diseases. And about, oh, about almost over 10 years ago now, they identified that this, the process, the antibody and antigen, the, the, the disease causing process is an antibody directed at, in a large proportion of people, 
65, 70% of people, is an antibody directed against something called PLA2R. And this is now a blood test we can measure. So someone comes in membranous nephropathy, I can measure PLA2R, I can give them medication to treat their condition, I can see the PLA2R level clear, and I know with confidence that their protein losing kidney disease will improve. Um, and also it can help with diagnosis without having to have another uh, repeated biopsies and things like that. Um, I'd love to have that for other, for uh, minimal change, for various causes of FSGS. Um, there may be close. Um, there's a, a group out of the Harvard Medical School that's founded, uh, seen that a subset of patients with minimal change have an autoantibody to something called nephrin, um, one of the proteins I mentioned earlier. And so they are developing a way for us to check that in the blood. Hopefully in the next few years, we'll have that available for a subset of people with, you know, with uh, minimal change and FSGS. If they have an autoantibody to nephrin, we can use that as a, as a marker of disease, but also a marker of response to treatment. I'd like to see other better ways to look at treatment response. All the things we've talked about are very indirect, protein loss, kidney function. These are not really telling me what's happening at the cellular level. Um, and that would give us a better idea of kind of what, how, uh, how much success we're actually achieving. Definitely would like a non-steroid option, the first line therapy for both these conditions. And along those lines, not immunosuppressive therapy for initial and maintenance treatment. Now, again, the pandemic has highlighted while we have used these drugs, and oftentimes with success, they carry a, their own risk. And um, we've had to definitely consider with each person, what are, we, you know, what are the trade-offs of doing that? And then lastly, of course, um, you know, what if people do get transplanted, how can we better predict the risk of recurrence and, and really intervene appropriately? So I will stop there um, in terms of what I had uh, uh, set to say, um, and I will leave it up for um, some questions. I think we have some time for questions, so I will leave it up to uh, um, you guys. Sure. Well, Dr. Adani, thank you so much. This has really been interesting. Um, so folks, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, we do have one from Jean. What are your thoughts? Uh, hopefully I'm reading this correctly. What are the thoughts to be most like, what are the most likely causes of relapse for minimal change? And would, um, I think like if you taper off the prednisone too quickly, would you relapse? And I think the last part of the question is what effect of medrol infusions on holding off any relapse? I hope I read that correctly. Okay, uh, that was good. so uh, good question. So. Um, cause of relapse, um, yes, certainly if you, um, we know that the, the steroid taper does have to be slow at the, at the tail end, if you taper too quickly. And the idea in my mind, and I'm not a, you know, I'm not a molecular biologist, but is again, that residual effect of whatever is causing the immune injury um, is, um, you know, lingering. And um, so as you start to taper off, you need to have a little bit of that anti-inflammatory effect of the steroid. We know these are immune system ultimately triggers. And so we know that in, I think in the pediatric literature even much more, um, during you know, viral infection season, cold and flu season, we see more relapses because the immune system gets activated by something, not just you know, in influenza or not you know, say COVID, but any sort of what otherwise would be a benign infection um, triggers the immune system and sparks this kind of relapse. Um, in general, if I have someone, again, as an adult patient that I am seeing that has frequent relapse, I try to steer away from steroids um, once they have achieved remission. Um, so I will use things like rituximab um, much more uh, um, readily or earlier on, um, because I do see that, and again, the steroid responsive uh, approach, um, uh, the sorry, the steroid responsive individuals, they can have a very good sustained remission uh, with rituximab. So um, other ways like uh, using low doses of steroids, uh, medrol infusions, certainly those are ways to potentially, again, um, keep things 
quieted. But if you would ask me what I would prefer, I would kind of go toward something that's perhaps a little more definitive, but also something that's a little more targeted um, in terms of the immune response. So I, you know, steroids are upfront what we reach for to give us this idea whether people are steroid responsive or steroid resistant. And because some people, and also because some people respond very quickly to steroids. But once I know that response, I try not to use them again, unless that's really the only option we have, or for whatever reason, they can't get any of the other medications we've talked about. Great. I have another question here. Is it common to have a single response of steroids or, gosh, I wish I had a better medical term, um, tracrolimus? Is it common uh, to have a single response to steroids or tracolimus? This happened to our daughter and we couldn't get another response even with increased dosage. Rituximab has been working so far, um, but they just came off 21 days of that. Yeah, so um, so definitely there's this idea that people have what we call primary steroid resistance versus secondary steroid resistance. Um, uh, <clears throat> so people can be responsive to the steroids the first time and then uh, not have it uh, subsequent times. And so this is definitely, um, I would say not the, the norm, but certainly frequent. And that's where, uh, I, you know, as, as you know, you've already outlined, um, th things like rituximab and cyclophosphamide can be uh, more effective. You know, we don't, the problem is we don't really know why steroids work in this. Right? We know that it's an anti-inflammatory. We know that it's immunosuppressive to some degree. We don't know what it's actually achieving. And so if you, you know, the, the other difficult thing is you can say, okay, well, people are steroid resistant initially. They get, they get the disease the first time, steroid resistant. So we think, oh, maybe they don't have a steroid response to the disease and they get transplanted and then they recur. So it's suggesting that they really did have an immune mediated process. Um, and so this is where finding other pathways to target the immune system really becomes key. Calcineur inhibitors, um, tacrolimus and such are, um, I think that they're, uh, I think we know that their benefits or their, their mechanism by which that they help with um, uh, reducing protein in the urine is not just by the immune system effect. It's really about kind of a local, again, reinforcing that kidney filter. But again, if the kidney filter is being constantly affronted, then they will not be enough. Um, and so I think, that, again, the longer you've had the condition, there's more of a chance for the immune system to keep at it. And so then your response to um, therapies becomes, uh, oftentimes becomes less especially, I see this, especially in the adult population. And so that's why I'm more, and again, this is not the guideline. This is not, not what the, the, necessarily the scientific evidence suggests, but I'm much more likely to give things like rituximab or cyclophosphamide earlier on um, to really try, try to, again, get that reboot um, of the immune system, even to the degree that again, and I use a disclaimer, this is not based on randomized controlled trials, but this is based on experience is if I have an adult who I have a high suspicion that they're gonna relapse just because they're an adult and their nephronic syndrome was quite bad. And I know that another course of steroids is not gonna be a great, good idea for them. We will use steroids upfront, achieve remission and then give rituximab at the same time to sort of consolidate the, the remission. Um, and that way, now if you give rituximab too early in that process though, it can be difficult because again, if they're losing a lot of protein, they may lose the rituximab itself. And they may, the antibody may also be lost in the urine. So you try to achieve a remission as much as possible with whatever agent, give the, give the other more definitive therapy and then taper off the other one. Wonderful. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, a person asks, what do you look for in clinical trials or do you look to your patients to bring clinical trials to you? Well, we do clinical studies, so we have access to most of the trials that are ongoing. Um, or I, we have a network. I'm in Chicago, so we have a network of other medical centers um, that have clinical trials going. So we, I'd say, I'm pretty in tune with what's going on, and again, really want to find the right one for the right person. I think people who have steroid-resistant FSGS or steroid-resistant mineral change, for that matter, should be considered for a clinical trial early on. 
because none of the other therapies are really um, have been you know um, consistently uh, effective. So, and you know, again, if you look at the protocol of the clinical trial, can you be on concomitant you know calcineurin inhibitors? Can you be on other therapy? Um, uh, um, that can, you know, that, that's what I kind of look for. Um, but I look for that earlier on. If a patient brings up a clinical trial, absolutely. If it's one I'm not familiar with, then we want to investigate it. Um, just by virtue of what I do, I'd say that doesn't, it's not the norm. Um, um, but I, you know, I think that's, uh, uh, I think, but I'm sure it's true for individuals that are not doing clinical trials routinely. I think you have to have an open mind um, and I think, again, you have, there's no harm in finding out. Like if you go to a clinical trial site, you talk to them, you get screened, you haven't committed to anything. Um, you've just committed to hearing what they have to say. And if you look at it and you talk to the, the investigator and you talk to you know, your own uh, physician or whoever you trust, you think it's the right thing for you, then by all means, um, we would love it. Um, but uh, you know, I think getting the word out and expressing interest and you have every right if your your own clinician is not um, involving you or has uh, brought it up, you have every right to seek it out. And I think that's where the gateway is so helpful because you can search by zip code and location and your disease state and say, okay, where trials are available to me locally? And, you know, can I, um, and you don't need a referral, you don't need anything, you just need to find the person and, and contact them. Great. Um, you know what, we'll end with one last question. What are your thoughts on CELSEP for adults who steroid responsive, but steroids are too toxic for the patient? No, I, I think it's a decent option. Um, I think it's sort of the same pathway as things like rituximab or cyclophosphamide. Um, I, uh, I think it may not be strong enough at times. So, uh, you know, usually favor um, cyclophosphamide initially um, as a as an approach. If cyclophosphamide toxicity is unacceptable, then mycophenolate or CELSEP is the next option. Um, our clinical data, our, you know, our scientific data has not suggested CELSEP to be consistently one. Um, but I think along the path of someone who's steroid responsive, I think it has a potential role. Steroid resistant, I have very high doubts that it would it would um, be successful. Great. Well, there are a couple more questions, but I know we have to uh, end this uh, session so we could get into our regional community sessions. Once again, Dr. Donnie, I could you've you've had over thirty some odd people come in this in one of our, our large groups, and um, I can tell just by the comments. I hope you were able to see some that people have really appreciated your insight and everything that you've been talking about today. Um, I have cut and pasted some of the other questions, and maybe we can, you know, I know Kelly's going to do a follow up email. Maybe we can have those answered, um, but. Um, as you see on the screen right now, we want to say thank you to all our sponsors who uh, helped to make today's patient summit happen. Um, we're going to be taking a short break from 2.40 to 2.50. And 